order members. It's time for questions in the House of Public Safety. And we'll first start with oral questions. And question number three has been uh, withdrawn. Cahill Boyle. Mr. Boyle. Uh, could I just take this opportunity to apologise to you for missing the recent question time, uh, Mr. Speaker? Um, Kest Everhain, question number one, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, sorry. Uh, the GP out of our framework was approved by me in January 2014, and a project board chaired by the Regional Health and Social Care Board is in place to take uh, the work forward. Implementation of the GP out of our framework is necessarily dependent on alignment with the number of health and social care projects, including the 111 telephone number, and the development of a directory of service and web portal. It is therefore not possible at this stage to give a definitive timetable for the business case process and the overall implementation of the framework. Market, I can call you, well, the Minister has been late, I thought it was the out hours question time. But can the Minister clarify that the GP out hours activity has increased by 18 per cent, whilst activity through the emergency departments has decreased by 2 per cent? Well, certainly, uh, GP hours, or GP out of hours, um, are very busy places. So in 2012 13, the providers dealt with some 606,000 patients. Of those, 220,000 received telephone advice, another 174,000 visited an out-of-hour centre for treatment, and 31,000 received uh, home visits. So there is a considerable amount of work going on, and we understand uh, that GPs who work in the out-of-hour services um, do feel a considerable amount of pressure in terms of the, the service that they are providing, and it is a very challenging uh, environment for them. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister <clears throat> what is the Minister's assessment of the out of our service in the Nomavati area? As my understanding is that um, the doctors are being diverted, the out of our doctors are being diverted to Elton Galvin Hospital on a, well, se several nights a week. I suspect the member could tell me better what the service is like in the Limavati area, but nonetheless, there have been occasions when out of our centres have been unable to provide face to face consultations due to trusts being unable to secure full medical cover, and patients requiring face to face consultations were either directed to other out of our centres in the trust area, um, and it should be emphasised that the telephone advice and home visits were provided as normal. Um, the issue raised is not unique to the Western Trust area. And over the past five years, um, there has been an 18 per cent increase in demand for the GP out of our services, which is particularly high during bank holidays and at weekends, which obviously places a significant pressure on the system. The Board, as the Commissioners of the Service, is acutely aware of the ongoing challenges faced by the Trusts, including difficulties in recruiting and retaining GPs and other clinical staff and is currently working with all providers, including the Western Urgent Care, to address them. Measures include the new way of working with GPs and out-of-hour staff and use of skill mix. And the Board does remain focused on providing safe and effective GP out-of-hour services while working with staff, the public and stakeholders to develop and shape the future provision of GP out-of-hours. I would encourage the member uh, to con continue discussions uh, with senior trust representatives uh, in securing uh, the service that the people of Limon Valley would expect. Sean Rogers. Sir Rogers. Thanks to the Minister for his, for his answers thus far. Minister, could I ask you for your assessment of the recent report cited the concerns of out of Irish um, GPs in the Southern Health Trust area? Well, we, we requested that report, and uh, I think it's important that, that we've done that so that we can establish um, you know, the job satisfaction where the concerns are where problems are, because the report gives us the ability to address those issues. Uh, it was a tad unfortunate that um, so, some parts of the report um, were, were, were leaked in a way which actually uh, sought to undermine the service. I think that it's important uh, that we work closely uh, with the providers, uh, with the people who are on the front line, to ensure that it is a service that they want to be involved in, that they are delivering uh, to the best of their abilities, and the general public are the beneficiaries of such. Uh, Jim Wells. Mr. Wells. Number three, Mr. Speaker. 
As I have previously outlined, the House my department faces a considerable challenge in 2014-15, with some £160 million of additional resources estimated to be required in order to balance the books. The deficit remains despite my commitment to deliver some £170 million of savings. I have therefore requested further resources in the June monitoring round, and if these are not forthcoming, then the Executive will effectively be agreeing to a number of serious implications, such as pay constraint on hard-working staff, to reduce the range or standard of services offered, and the introduction of additional charges or co-payments for services, longer waiting times for scheduled care. So let me be clear, I have not and will not take actions by myself that will have an impact on frontline care for patients and clients. Equally, I will not plan or make cuts in vital health and social care services to pay for the current refusal of some members of this House to take the necessary decisions in relation to welfare reform. To do nothing on welfare reform is not an option for the Executive. The failure to agree welfare reform is unforgivable. As the financial penalties being imposed by the Treasury are surely better directed at the meeting the real and pressing health and social care needs of some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Mr. Wells. The Minister paints quite a bleak picture for the present financial year. If the welfare reform issue isn't settled and settled soon, what are the implications for future budgets of the Department if we have to continue to pay penalties to Westminster because of our inability to deal with this issue? Pressures will increase further. <clears throat> Every department will feel the pinch, and the Department of Health, as being the largest recipient of funding, will, will feel, the, feel the pinch um, greater than anyone else. Some of the things that we have put in bid for, bids for, and members will rightly challenge me on them safety and quality of services. £13 million we need, and um, we'll see if we get that. Unscheduled care. People are always shouting about emergency departments. We've put in a bid for £22 million. If some people think that that's better spent on welfare, that's a matter for them. Family health services, £6.2 million. Public health, £10.5 million. Children's services, protecting our youngest and most vulnerable, £9 million. Support at home, largely dormitory care for, for, for vulnerable elderly people, £8.5 million. Specialist service, £20 million. Historical institutional abuse inquiry, half a million. Clinical negligence, 10 million. Elective care, dealing with those hip replacements, knee replacements, and all of that, 30 million pounds. TYZ sensational funding, 21.3. Mental health and learning disability, 9 million. Perhaps some of the other members would like to tell me which bids I shouldn't be making. Phil Flanagan, Mr. Flanagan. Jordan, I don't want to steal uh, Mr. Beggs' thunder bay asking about budgets and, and a previous health minister, but um, can, can I ask the minister whether it would be better served um, not wasting money on following his own um, ideological campaigns against delivering equality for people, as opposed to blaming every um, mess he's overseen in the health service since he took office three years ago on welfare reform, um, fines which haven't even um, started to be implemented um, by the executive yet? Uh, I, I really do despair at the lack of knowledge demonstrated by the member who has just spoken. Order. 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 <clears throat> you know, the fact that members will close their eyes to the fact you take a decision, that's fine, stand by your decision. Come to this House and say, we believe that we're better spending this money on welfare than on health. Stand up and say it, and don't be such a card, Mr. Speaker. People need to be very clear. Money is being taken from the Northern Ireland budgets. The consequence of that money being taken from the Northern Ireland budget is impacting health, it's impacting education, it's impacting justice, and the members opposite are the people who are doing it. So let's stand up and be counted here. If you're going to do it, tell the public why you're doing it. Quit hiding behind this issue that the money isn't really being taken when we all know that it is. Roy Bates. Mr. Speaker. The Minister has indicated he has bid for this £160 million uh, in June monitoring, um, but such uh, a deficit to maintain existing services did not suddenly develop. Would the Minister confirm the level of debt that existed within our health service in the last financial year, despite the £100 million in your monitoring, and would he confirm 
that this exists despite or, or even aside from the welfare reform issue? Well, over the course of the last three years, we have received um, around 2% of, of an increase each year. I suppose demand has increased by around 6% each year. Um, so we have able, been able to absorb uh, £500 million pounds of savings, uh, whilst at the same time we have increased the number of nurses, we have increased the number of doctors, increased the number of allied health professionals. On most of the, the, the scheduled care, we have been able to reduce waiting times, and we have been able to reduce waiting times on, on 12 hour waits in our emergency departments. So against the backdrop um, of the budget that we are given, we have been able to make savings and deliver a better service. Uh, but in all of these things, uh, we had our, 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 our cycle, we came to the end of that cycle, we have another year added on, and at this moment in time, there is £160 million of a gap. We are making £170 million of savings, but there is a further £160 million of a gap that I can't deliver upon. So that's why I have come to this House consistently for the past number of months and said that that gap exists. Now, can we drive another £20 or £30 billion out of it? That remains to be seen. But the reality is that the figure will not move fundamentally. I, do, I will not find £160 billion of further savings without having hugely negative impacts upon the health service. And that's a message that needs to be got out there. And if people think that they're better spending that money on welfare, well, that's fine. Get out there and tell the public that you think you'd rather spend the money on welfare than you would in health, and consequently people will wait longer on operations. We will not be able to deliver to the same standards of safety. We will not be able to make the, 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 the changes in unscheduled care that everybody has been demanding. If you want to say that, get out there and tell the public that. I am telling the public now, I want to improve the health service. I want to deliver. But if you are going to cash strap me in key areas, then that is going to make it extremely difficult to carry out that delivery. Mr. McKinney. Mr. McKinney. And I thank the Minister. And, would, and wouldn't his arguments have greater weight and credibility, not just in this House, uh, but in the wider public mind, if he was able to demonstrate some measurability in his transforming your care plan uh, against the 99 targets that uh, he has set in place, so that people would understand not just that he needs the money, but where the money is going on? And, and wouldn't that uh, achieve a greater um, uh, uh, understanding in the public mind and maybe understanding for his position? I don't think I have any problem explaining to the public the position, and I don't think that I can add much weight to an argument which says we in the trusts have, have identified a problem and they've brought it forward to, to the department. That problem was identified around the middle of last year, and consequently we overrun our budget last year by £15 million. So that was money that we weren't able to live within our means even last year as a consequence of rising demand. We are able to anticipate that that demand is continuing to increase because of the demography of our population. Mr. Um, McKinney may not have realised that our population has been getting older over the course of the last number of years, and we have far more frailty to deal with. We have far more issues out there on, on childcare services and ensuring that we protect vulnerable children, particularly on the back of the BBC revelations. So in all of that there, we have a pressing demand. If Mr. McKinney wants to ignore the pressing demand and say, oh yes, we are supporting uh, the, the current welfare procedures, we don't mind that someone is getting £26,000. In fact, that cap shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be put there. Uh, it's equivalent of £35,000. Uh, and we actually don't mind the low-paid workers in the health service who are maybe earning half of that, not getting pay rises. That's OK for the SDLP and Sinn Féin. It's not OK. It's not right. We shouldn't be doing it. And it's time that the SDLP and Sinn Féin come into the real world, come into government and done things right and ensured that we delivered for the public instead of delivering to agendas. Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. On Monday, the 16th of June, I was delighted to launch in Northern Ireland the annual Military and Civilian Health Partnership Awards for 2014. These prestigious awards aim to promote and publicly recognise the efforts of health professionals in providing care to service personnel, their families, and veterans throughout the United Kingdom. This is an opportunity for us to celebrate their work, which often goes unseen but it is vital to ensuring the armed forces community receives the care and support they deserve. Last year we had two finalists from Northern Ireland, 204 Field Hospital and 253 Medical Regiments, who were quite rightly recognised for their exceptional work. I am sure they are not alone. 
and I would encourage nominations from Northern Ireland to ensure the skill, dedication and commitment of those who work in this field is recognised. Uh, thank, <coughs> thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, it, it is appropriate, uh, I think, uh, today especially, uh, uh, Minister, that uh, on this 1st of July, for those who gave their lives uh, for our freedom, and indeed those who have served this nation well over the, uh, the, the, the past years, that we indeed pay tribute to them and respect them and respect the fact that many of them will have both physical and health needs. I wonder, uh, Minister, would you comment on how the individual soldier or serviceman and woman in particular might access the health provision? Well, I think it's very important that, that we do recognise that and we also recognise <coughs> that the Army is moving more uh, to, to be more reliant on reserves uh, and rest reliant on the regular Army and that Northern Ireland, in spite of Northern Ireland's makeup, is contributing twice as many reserve soldiers to the Army per head of population than any other part of the United Kingdom. Now, that's a very clear recognition of the support that there is um, for the British Army here in Northern Ireland and the work that they're doing. My uh, department has taken a number of actions to support access to health care services by the armed forces, such as the Armed Forces Liaison Forum, engagement in mental health services, anaesthetics are working well, and I recognise that there will be new challenges for us to address. Through the Armed Forces Liaison Forum, we are alerted to innovations elsewhere that could be of use here. And my department is currently working with the Royal College of General Practitioners to obtain access to the e-learning package for military personnel, which is available to GPs in England, to assist in dealing with former military personnel who may access primary medical services from their local GP practice. David McElveen. Mr. McElveen. Number five, Mr. Speaker. On the 17th of June 2014, my department launched a draft 10-year home accident prevention strategy for consultation. I expect to publish the final strategy by the end of the year. My department also provides core funding for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents in Northern Ireland. In addition, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Michael McBride, is leading a UK group to look at how we can prevent further tragic deaths in children and injuries caused by blind cord strangulation. Finally, my department continues to work with the Health and Safety Executive to promote awareness of the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning. DHSS PS has produced a public information leaflet entitled Carbon Monoxide, Are You at Risk? And this is available online. Michael Bain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answer. I wonder if the Minister advise the House today of perhaps any further initiatives um, that his department is uh, taking forward in this regard? Well, as I indicated, <coughs> Dr. McBride is working with ROSPA and, and UK health agencies and the, the, the British Blind and Shutter Association um, on that particular issue. Um, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service has been working in partnership with the PSNI and a broad range of public, private, voluntary and community-based organisations on that Northern Ireland's first interactive learning education centre called RADAR, which is Risk Avoidance Danger Awareness Resource. And when opened, the centre will provide safety-focused learning experience for children and young people throughout Northern Ireland. Children and young people who visit the centre will develop their own personalised radar, and these radars will help them to manage everyday risk and guide them in making better decisions. In Northern Ireland, it may, may surprise people that uh, certainly whenever I left DOE, we were looking at around 50 people being killed on our roads and orders went up um, uh, some in, in the last couple of years. In the home, there's twice as many being killed. In the home, there's two deaths per week, similar to what we're, we, we, we're finding uh, in, in drug abuse. So we need to be aware that uh, the homes can be dangerous places for many people and that we need to take steps to make them safer. And uh, the more uh, we can get these messages out, uh, the better for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
pick up maybe on a point that the Minister has made, that twice as many people do die uh, in accidents in the home than the like of driving a car uh, or on a farm even. And given that there has been a hard-hitting campaign, um, advertising campaign um, across the TV uh, delivering that message, can I ask the Minister, has he any plans to uh, initiate a similar scheme that would, um, and campaign that would help raise the awareness uh, around a campaign the like of TV advertising? Yeah, there's, well, obviously, uh, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister have, have taken over um, the issue of, of uh, advertising, and that's now dealt with at the centre as opposed to individual departments. Um, DOE uh, were making the case that, that they should uh, be able to maintain the same level of funding. Um, uh, I was making the argument that we should actually be focusing on some other things. Uh, so we do have, uh, in, including uh, home safety, we do have our, our Home Accident Prevention Strategy, which was launched for consultation uh, on 17 June, and that is aimed at the entire population of Northern Ireland, but focuses on the most vulnerable groups in our society, which is the under fives and the over 65s and the most socially deprived. And the vision of the strategy is that the population of Northern Ireland has the best chance of living safely uh, in the home environment. The partners in the strategy will seek to deliver the vision and aim through the following objectives. Uh, number one, to empower people to better understand the risks and make safe choices to ensure a safe home with negligible risk of unintentional injury. Two is to promote safer home environments. Three is to promote and facilitate effective training skills and knowledge in home accident prevention across all relevant organisations and groups. And four was to improve the evidence base. So in all of this, um, we will be making bids uh, to carry out advertising as appropriate and get key messages out there as to certainly the more simple steps that people can take to ensure the homes are safer places. Cahill O'Hoshin. Mr O'Hoshin. Well, I've got to call in court a uh, case to Rashid. The whole question six. The Early Intervention Transformation Programme is one of three strands being developed under the Delivering Social Change Framework. The ITP, which will be launched formally in the near future, seeks to transform mainstream children's services through embedding early intervention approaches in order to deliver sustained improvements and outcomes for children that continue beyond the lifespan of the programme. With contributions from five government departments, including my own, Justice, Education, Employment and Learning and Social Development, the EITP represents a commitment across government to work together to break the intergenerational cycle of poor outcomes that some children and families experience throughout Northern Ireland. The programme is being led by my department. Uh, a programme manager is now in place in the preparatory work to identify the first wave of projects that we intend to take forward under this initiative is underway. Could the Minister tell us will the fund be targeted to areas of rural deprivation and high social need? The fund is aimed at uh, areas of, of high social need and uh, there's a course of work that's been done uh, in, across the trusts uh, to ensure that we uh, set up the hubs in the appropriate places. I think that we all need to recognise uh, that many children uh, have poor outcomes because they don't get the right start in life and very often parents lack the skills uh, to give those children the right, the right start in life. So the more that we can provide support to those parents and the more that we can sustain and help them and help those children in those early years, uh, whether it be nurturing, whether it be nutrition, whether it be on education, all of those things, we need to be making a substantial difference in the very earliest years. Uh, for children to progress and to do well. And if they, tend to, if they start school behind the rest, they tend to fall further behind, and the poor educational outcomes very often deliver poor health outcomes, poor employment uh, outcomes, and a much higher uh, level of, of, of people who actually end up in uh, the justice system. Uh, all of those things we want to challenge, and all of those things we want to change. Peter Weir. Mr. Weir. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his response so far. Uh, it's important in, on these type of programmes to get sort of buy-in from local people. Can I ask the Minister what community engagement has taken place about the, the programme? Well, uh, there's considerable engagement underway, including uh, via the five children's outcomes groups, locality planning groups to help shape the development of EIT project proposals. And outcome groups comprise local community, voluntary and statutory sector and organisations who are involved in delivering the services to children, young people and families. Uh, we are slightly behind in North and West Belfast uh, in terms of the establishment of, of, of the project 
and that has been largely because the engagement hasn't been as good as we would have liked. Uh, so we, we will catch up, um, we will deliver on that programme, um, but we are absolutely certain that we need the buy-in of the community sector and therefore will want to ensure that that's on board um, before we move ahead. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. For his answer and fully support anything he says. But in a modern society in Western Europe, would the Minister agree with me that the gap between the haves and the half-nots in terms of health and education is embarrassingly wide? And will he continue to strive for additional resources to engage with the local communities and ensure this programme really does impact on the people that need it best? I, I do agree, and that's why I, I think that we need to look at the, the, the problem and the issue. And I believe that the main uh, problem is that where people have poor educational outcomes, they have poor health outcomes. So they don't get the right start in life, um, they don't get the opportunities at school, and they don't deliver uh, in terms of, of, of health and indeed job opportunities. So we need to give these children who are brought into this world the best start in life, and that's why we want to provide that support where the capacity doesn't exist. Um, I think that a lot of social change took place, particularly in the 1970s. A lot of the urban villages in Belfast were broken up. Families didn't have the support structure that had been in place for generations. And consequently, we're looking at people who are second, third, fourth generation unemployed. And all of that uh, has a trickle-down effect, which is damaging to the young people. We need to alter that. We need to change it. And that's why I'm very supportive of this programme. Stephen Agnew. Mr Agnew. Mr Speaker, and I, I welcome uh, the Minister's an announcement on this, that there's five departments working together on this. Could I ask how the programme then is, is funded um, and whether or not there's been pulling of budgets between the, the, the various departments involved? Well, the programme is funded through Atlantic Philanthropies, uh, providing £15 million in the five government departments, providing the other £15 million. Gordon Dunn. Mr Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number seven, please. All cancer drugs approved by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence that are available in England are either currently funded or available via cost per case mechanism in Northern Ireland. The Health and Social Care Board has also a clear process by which unapproved cancer drugs can be made available to patients in Northern Ireland. The Board has informed me that 98% of the applications for unapproved drugs are accepted. I have therefore instructed my department to evaluate whether the IFR process is meeting uh, the IFR process is meeting its objectives and taking account of the measures that other devolved administrations are considering in their approach towards access to specialist drugs. That evaluation will get underway shortly and I will report the findings to the Assembly later this year. No. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister clarify how much is spent annually on cancer drugs? And can she also clarify how effective the individual funding requests are, because certainly during our recent visits to the cancer uh, centre in, at the City Hospital, uh, the evidence there was that the individual funding requests are not being honoured. And are, can we have clarification on that, please? Thank you. Well, in terms of cancer drugs, <coughs> the expenditure for year 13-14 was around £26.7 million. Um, that doesn't include the cost of other treatments related to cancer, such as radiotherapy. And there are other costs related to cancer that are difficult to determine, um, such as voluntary and community care. Uh, during the April 2013 to the 31st of January 2014, £1.14 million pounds was spent on in the, in the individual funding requests uh, for cancer drugs, and 98% of those were given out. Oncologists will be circumspect in what they apply for, so they will apply where they believe that it makes a real and fundamental difference, um, and that is, that is uh, something that the oncologists actually support and buy into. Uh, so it's very, very important that we recognise that the oncologists, where they are making the case, that largely those cases um, are found to be acceptable. Price, pharmaceutical price regulation scheme. Has there been an increase in the use of branded medicines in, in the last three months of this year? And if so, by how much? Well, there certainly has been a considerable in increase in the use of branded medicines. Um, 
uh, across Northern Ireland, not just in the last three months, but across the last three years. Now, that is something that this Assembly was pressing for, something that they were endorsing, that in terms of drugs, in terms of the health budget, that we um, are not giving uh, as much to pharmaceutical companies, and that we're actually delivering more on the ground. So actually moving from generic to branded is something which has the support of this Assembly. And a lot of that money, uh, to be honest, has been used in, in, in various elements of the budget. So, for example, we are spending more on domiciliary care than we were last year and the year before and the year before. We're spending more on uh, protecting children than last year and the year before and the year before that. And there's a whole series of things that we're spending more money on. We're spending more money on cancer drugs now, considerably more than we were three years ago. So if individuals think that it's some, there's some easy thing here, and, and we'll, we'll take this bit of health and, and, and we'll apply that there, and we'll ignore the fact that uh, actually there's more older people and they need more domiciliary care, that there's more children who are, are, are vulnerable, so we'll, we'll not bother doing that bit this year. We can't do that. We have to look at it in a holistic way. The truth is that we have £160 million of the gap, gap, and we don't have the money to buy the additional drugs. PPRS has been around for some 50 years. It's not something new. We anticipated uh, the savings that would be coming in. They will not buy the cancer drugs that, that um, currently England's uh, cancer fund is, is paying for. So let's, let, let's, let's get those facts out into the domain and debate it rationally. Order members, we now move to topical questions uh, to the minister. Question number two has been withdrawn. Tom Elliott. Mr Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm wondering if the, the Minister can detail which health trust has purchased uh, paediatric parental nutritional products from ITH Pharma? Um, I didn't quite pick up the question right, but, but I am not aware of, of what we have purchased of ITH Pharma. Uh, I can endeavour to, to, to find the answer for the member, although I suspect he already knows the answer. Um, so so I, I, can, I can certainly uh, see, see what I can find out on his behalf. Mr Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And just to, to confirm, I don't know the answer, uh, and that's why I asked it. But uh, there was a contaminated batch, as I understand, in England uh, of that product. Uh, maybe he realises now, and uh, I just was looking for assurances that none of that contaminated batches which had significant consequences and, and resulted in deaths in England, that none of that contaminated batch has come to Northern Ireland? Um, thank you for that. I usually try to ask questions that I do know the answers to, because that's an easier way to catch a minister up, uh, out whenever I was uh, a backbencher. But nonetheless, um, it's a good question. We will identify uh, what, what we have been sourcing from that organisation, um, and, and if there has been any risk, risk posed there, um, we'll make that clear to the member uh, in due course. David Hillage. Mr. Hillage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What contact has the Minister had with the Westminster Government regarding the so-called legal highs? Yeah, legal highs is something that we have uh, been, been challenging on. In fact, uh, the British Irish Council uh, met in Dublin. Norman Becker was representing the Westminster Government, and again, the issue uh, was high on the agenda. Legal highs are something that has contributed to many of the deaths across Northern Ireland. Uh, many of the psychoactive substances um, that are, are in them uh, are, are not legal, and, and that definition uh, probably needs to be changed uh, because these are not uh, things which people should, 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 should be taking. In terms of Westminster, they have, are, have almost completed the course of work that, that I had asked them to do um, around six months ago, and that, that has now been brought forward uh, over the course of the next two to three weeks and there will be recommendations flowing from that. They have been looking at what they have been doing in the United States of America, the Republic of Ireland and New Zealand, where actions have been taken, uh, stronger actions. And it's, it's going to be very difficult to stay ahead of the curve on legal highs. I would very much want to stay ahead of the curve, but if we can't be ahead of it, we need to be right up there in, in, in terms of ensuring that those people who actually peddle these um, that we can actually get in there quickly to ensure they are banned straight away. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the comments of the Minister. But what, what assessment, Minister, did you make of the British Irish Council meeting last week? Well, in, in terms of that, I thought it was very useful. Uh, the, every, everyone was very impressed by the actions that Belfast City Council uh, took. 
put on the back of uh, a proposal by Councillor Ga um, Gavin Robinson, uh, which uh, led to actions being taken against the, the, the legal, legal high shops. And, uh, they have been able to close down a number of those facilities uh, as a result of their actions, and, and other uh, uh, countries are, are looking at doing the same thing. So, uh, they, they were very interested in that. I think that there has to be a UK-wide response to this and that we need actions from Westminster who have the legislative powers to actually move this forward and that it needs to be legislation that will enable us to respond very, very swiftly within hours um, or, or a few days of discovering something to close that down because we have pharmacists uh, in many parts of the world producing this and making a slight alteration, which all of a sudden something which you had deemed to be illegal could be legal, um, and therefore we need to be very quick to respond to that. Megan Fear. Can I ask the Minister to outline what the cost would be, um, the administration cost for reintroducing prescription charges? Well, it all depends um, how you would introduce prescription charges. If you introduced it um, in the previous system, um, the costs uh, would be higher. Uh, because you would have to um, identify the 11 per cent who would actually be paying and, and the 89 per cent who would not be paying. So let us be very clear, under the old system, 89 per cent of prescriptions were free in any event. There was only 11 per cent of prescriptions were actually paid for. Um, but I think the cons one of the consequences, uh, perhaps an unvisaged consequence of free prescriptions, is that it actually drove up the number of people who went to see doctors and who were requesting prescriptions for things like paracetamol, which was costing um, 40p in the local supermarket. So we had an unintended consequence that happened there. Uh, so we, we would have higher costs if it came in in that way. Uh, if you introduced um, a prescription, uh, which was a very small charge for every prescription, with then a, a maximum payment for anybody uh, in the year, and I'd suggest a £25 maximum payment for, for, for throughout the year, which is uh, less than 50p a week, um, then the costs, the administration costs of, of that type of system uh, would be very modest indeed. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister to outline the extent of what prescription charge, or prescription, um, charge fraud was in the past and who was the most likely to, to, to partake in prescription fraud? What was the most common source of it? Well, there, there was greater levels of prescription charge in, in, in uh, particular areas. I'm not going to get into that t today and, and, and name areas, uh, but nonetheless uh, it was higher in, in particular areas. Uh, many people were quite happy to go in and pay for the prescription. In fact, many people feel quite guilty. Many people feel quite guilty about going in and getting a free prescription, including myself, whenever I know that others out there could be receiving drugs which we currently are not finding affordable, but who would benefit from those drugs. And they may not be life-saving drugs. They may be merely life-prolonging drugs. But if your life can be prolonged for two or three months and there are special events coming up in your family, um, you want to see your child's birthday, you want to see that wedding, there's particular things that you want to see. And someone like me doesn't have to pay for a prescription. In fact, anybody in here can well afford to pay for a prescription, but you don't have to do it. Whilst others who need it can't get it. I actually think if you're a good socialist, you'd be supporting what I'm doing. A good socialist wouldn't be saying, give, 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 the, give the rich and everybody else free prescriptions and, and de deny people who have cancer the opportunity of living a little longer. I don't think that's right. Tommy Douglas. Mr. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what impact he anticipates the new public health framework will have? Well, in terms of the public health framework, uh, it is absolutely critical that we respond um, in terms of public health to, to the needs of the public. And unless we actually challenge and get people into a better place, because public health has been defining, uh, th th then we are going to have to live with, with a difficult consequence. And if we want to ensure that um, the generation that we are currently um, being brought up in Northern Ireland is likely not to live as long as the people um, who are around now. So this is the first time that's going to happen for years and years and years. Life expectancy is something that has been, has been increasing. But for young people being born now, life expectancy will be shorter. 
So it's absolutely critical and vital that the public health framework is out there and that we get out there, that we support it financially and we get the messages out to the public of what is beneficial to them. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I just follow that question uh, by another question in terms of the assessment he makes of the potential benefits of new technology for diabetes care, uh, such as the DNAV? Fantastic opportunity. Uh, delighted that the South Eastern Trust are doing the work that they are doing. Diabetes is something which is growing and growing and growing. Type 2 diabetes. Um, we we, we uh, can be at the forefront in the world with this DNAV technology. Uh, the device allows people with diabetes to easily regulate their own insulin dosage by using a small device uh, around the size of a mobile phone. I have called it uh, the dock in the park because people have uh, basically the equivalent of going to um, a consultant and getting a checkup. They can actually have that in their pocket and get their checkup every day. And consequently, their dosage can be adjusted upwards or downwards uh, to meet their true needs. And we're actually finding that people's dosages are generally coming downwards. So it's something which is very, very positive and something which I believe will be commonplace um, over the course of the next decade. And Northern Ireland will have been leading the way in delivering that. Robin Newton, not in his place. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister advise on how he sees a Connected Health Initiative being a driver for improving drugs trials at the Belfast Cancer Centre? Well, we've been hugely successful in terms of uh, drugs trials. And what the public won't know, or, or most people won't know, is that around one fifth, one fifth of people in Northern Ireland who have cancer have taken up uh, trials, are engaging in trials. And that has created the opportunity for many, many hundreds of people uh, to be able to, to avail of the most modern drugs available uh, because we are engaged in that way. We have uh, been developing a connected health integration platform which will help us to optimise our delivery of connected health and the establishment of an international analytics centre here in Northern Ireland. And that will ensure that we have a network uh, which is amongst the smartest and the most capable of actually linking people um, who have illnesses uh, to potential opportunities to cure those illnesses. So stratified medicine and all of those things create us wonderful opportunities uh, to ensure that we can identify um, the right resources uh, to individuals to provide the right courses of treatment to them. Mr. Don. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister recognise that the Queen's University Cancer and Cell Biology Centre has the potential to become a world leader in drugs trials and research? Absolutely. And, uh, I, I met with the, the new Vice-Chancellor of Queen's recently um, as to what the opportunities are. Elements of Queen's University at this moment in time are world-class. Significant elements of it are world-class in terms of the, the clinical uh, and medical research that, are, that is happening. We can make the university, and it's something that Minister Farai and Minister Foster and myself need to be taken to the executive. We can make that university uh, uh, clinical research truly world-class throughout, and I think that we should. Northern Ireland can be up there as a place which is of the highest standards anywhere in the world in terms of the medical research that is carrying out in cancer and a number of other fields. And uh, that is something that I am totally up for, and I am sure that uh, my other ministerial colleagues will want to do that as well, because it will deliver huge health benefits, it will also deliver benefits for jobs, and it will advance the institutions, uh, the academic institutions here in Northern Ireland. Dr. Alistair McDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thought the Minister was going to talk me out there, but uh, could I ask the Minister uh, for his assessment of the RQIA review into unscheduled care that was released today? Uh, I think the, the, the member would have a great interest in what I was previously talking about as well, I might add. But in terms of the RQIA review, um, I can talk a little more about it now. It is saying that uh, the Trust need to have stronger escalation plans in place. It is looking at the Royal Victoria Hospital, or, or the Belfast Trust rather, um, using the city hospital uh, as a route for the frail elderly to be going there directly instead of going to the emergency department. That is something which I embrace because I do not believe that our elderly people belong 
uh, in emergency departments or frail elderly with everything, all the other mayhem that, that, that goes with that. We're looking at using the city hospital um, for uh, a route for most respiratory patients. We're looking at enhancing uh, the matter hospital services that are provided in emergency care. So there's a lot of very useful uh, recommendations there. I spoke to the chair of Belfast Trust, and, uh, and I believe that we will be working on delivering those and delivering those in the near future, including elements of it in this autumn. Dr. Alice McDonald. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the minister if perhaps there's any point, or if he believes there's any any. Uh, benefit in going further up the demand chain and, and, and looking into unscheduled care and perhaps looking at the causes of the pressures in the first place or what's leading to the pressures that are causing the problems? Well, I think there's, there's things which are fundamentally different than they would have been years ago. And far more people are admitted through emergency departments to hospitals than was previously the case. And there needs to be a better relationship developed uh, between general practitioners and hospitals in terms of that admission process. Flows are a big problem, and that's one of the areas that we really need. It's recommended there. It's one of the areas that will be very challenging for us. But we need to get the flows right so that people that are, are leaving the hospital, that, that we're getting them out quicker and ensuring that we do not have delayed discharges and that uh, those beds become available uh, for more people in the emergency department. So there's a considerable amount of work to be done there. Um, the recommendations, in my opinion, are sound recommendations from our QIA. Uh, and I will be pressing the Belfast Trust and all of the trusts to implement those recommendations as early as possible. I indicated that we would bid for 20, something is 22 or 26 million uh, to, to actually deliver this. Um, and I did say that it would be better spent on emergency departments than on welfare. And I would welcome the support of others to ensure that we spend that money on emergency departments as opposed to complaining about the outcomes but not giving us the resource to do the job. Order members, that concludes questions to the Health Minister. We now move to